little guy. Okay. So, um, quick note before we get started on that is I gave you guys this uh, formula sheet. These are old printouts that I've had just laying around. I don't like to waste paper at all. I know it doesn't seem like it, but I don't, it hurts. Um, and so I keep these things around. And so just a heads up that the formula sheet might change a little bit. Uh, if anything, you'll have more information on there, right? So I'm not gonna take away information from here, but it might change just in layout uh, and stuff that's on there. But the tables, they'll stay the same. Okay. And so this copy that I gave you today, that's yours to do whatever you want with. As we get a new formula sheet, potentially, I'll print those off and give those to you as well. So then you'll have a copy uh, for tests and stuff. And then um, in the tests, I'll give you clean ones that you have to use, right? So you can't use your own for the tests, but at home you'll have the same version, right? So it's good to know what you'll have in a test scenario. So um, we haven't really dealt with a lot of formulas quite yet, right? And so um, chapter two though, we get into some more formulas and that's why I wanted you to have a copy of a formula sheet. So here we are. Okay. So, dun, 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 dun. assignment one, due on Wednesday. I think we're all pretty close to done, probably. Uh, part D, question one, part D is the one that we're going to answer today. Um, otherwise, you have everything that you need to do it. Any questions before we get started? No? Just quickly. I'm like, got it. Okay. So like I said, if you didn't get a copy of either of these printouts, uh, then just kind of hand hang back after class. I'll run upstairs, make photocopies. Forget it ever happened. So nice and sunny today, but not helpful. Luckily, most of you have it. So, in my copy, I fixed the the typo. That's the only thing I, or actually, there's two things I fixed. But um, on your copy, the should just has two stars about it or around it. That's markdown stuff, isn't it? So, um, so this is section one point seven. Section 1.7. So last day, right, we're not going to do that much of a review because we kind of closed a, a section. Right? Last day we talked about numerical data and we, I think we took two days to talk about it because there's a lot of stuff that we need to cover in there, right? So we talked about the mean and the median, the standard deviation, the interquartile range, the quartiles. How do we find outliers? We drew box plots. We drew stem and leaf plots. We did a lot of stuff. Right? And so that was all for numerical data. Right? Now, in section 1.7, we're just going to look at, OK, well, what do we do with categorical data? Generally, there's less stuff to do with categorical data. Remember, so categorical data is just if you have a spreadsheet and one of the columns just has um, things from categories, right? So like hair color, right? There's a set number of categories that you would have to classify everyone as, right? Eye color, another set of categories, right? Um, here, don't be alarmed. There is some R code in here. I'll talk about that. Um, we're gonna talk about the MT cards data set. So it's built into R and uh, it's just a nice, decent sized data set that we can look at and it has all these variables. And so uh, I think it's from 1947. It's in the footnotes. Yeah, or 1974, sorry. Big difference. Uh, just lots of numbers. 
Uh, and so it's just looking at the fuel consumption of 32 different cars uh, from the years 1973 to 1974. Right, so those models. And so they've collected a lot of different things. 11, I think, to be exact. Um, collected the miles per gallon. Right. Miles per gallon, because it's a measurement, that would be a numerical variable. Right? So any sort of measurement that we do is a numerical variable. So we can do that here. Numerical. We're not gonna do all of them. I'm just gonna talk about the first two. And then, but it might be a good exercise to read through these. You really only need the descriptions, right? To give you a good idea of if it's categorical or if it's numerical. So the number of cylinders is the next variable in this data set. And the number of cylinders, even though it's a number, it's not a measurement, right? It's just a category, All right? So this is a, a, our first categorical variable because you can have, it turns out you can have four, six or eight cylinders and that's it, All right? So each car, you can't have four and a half cylinders. And so there's only these three categories, four, six and eight. And we'll have a look at that, All right? And so this makes it categorical. Displacement, I don't know what they mean by that, right? I'm not a car person by any means, but looking at the cubic inches sounds like a measurement to me, right? And so I'll say it's numerical. Same thing with horsepower, right? We're gonna have a, a measurement for each car, right? So it'd be numerical as well. Rear axle ratio, I don't know. Ratio sounds like a, a measurement. And so you can go through this. Uh, the next variable that we'll look at is this VS variable. So uh, you can, I guess, either have a V-shaped engine or a straight engine. Right. So V-shaped or straight. And so it's so each car has either been put in a category of V-shaped or straight, and that's it, right? So here's our next categorical variable. Oops, what the? One thing to make a note of is we haven't seen this before. Well, we haven't seen you guys feel like you've seen a lot of stuff. We haven't seen nothing yet. So, uh, but this happens quite a bit where we have to record data. So instead of typing in V shaped or straight for each car, right, we're just going to say, oh, a zero denotes it's V shaped and a one denotes that it's straight. Right? And so we can use these numbers. So even though you might be looking at your spreadsheet and there's numbers everywhere. Those numbers could denote categories, right? And so that's why you want to read the description and say, okay, well, that sounds like a categorical variable to me, right? So you could have zeros and ones, or um, it happens again here, zero, one. So it's pretty common to go for zeros and ones. We like that stuff. Yeah. So here, What we're doing, we're using numbers to denote categories. Numbers to denote categories. I guess I should cut to the chase because you're all waiting to fill in the answer for 1D. You've got this uh, scenario of two variables, right? The satisfaction and the lab section are your two variables in this question on the assignment. 
And so I'm asking, how would you best visualize the lab section variable? So the lab section is a categorical variable, right? You're either in section one, two, or three, or four, or whatever. And so um, I have it here. But we should only use bar graphs or bar charts or bar plots, bars. We should only use bars to visualize categorical data. And so I'll highlight that here. Um, we should only use bar graphs for visualizing categorical data. So like I have in the blurb there, you've got lots of options, right? You could probably use a pie chart. Right? You could use a bar plot. Or you could even use a, a donut chart if you wanted to. But I'm just going to walk you through why we should just stick to bar graphs. What, one thing that you'll notice is that I use a graph, chart, and plot interchangeably. Okay. So I'll just make a note up here that a graph is a plot, which is a chart. And I just kind of, whatever one sounds good, I'll use. And so, so a bar graph is the same as a bar plot, which is the same as a bar chart. I only make a note of that because later on that might feel um, like, yeah, of course. But right now, we're learning all this terminology, and it's, it, there's a lot of terminology that we have to get a handle on, right? And so I know when I throw around terms like a bar graph and a bar plot and a bar chart, those might feel like different things, right? But just merge them all into the one thing, right? And um, same thing for pie graphs, pie charts, pie. I don't think I would say a pie plot, actually. Sounds funny. So maybe I should. But anyways, right, so I just use those interchangeably. So we have to be flexible. Huh? I don't even have a favorite. I say bar graph, bar plot, bar, bar chart. Oh, maybe not bar chart. Yeah, I do. Anyways, so just a heads up that those are all the same thing. Just lump them all together, lock it away. Huh? So remember, we're dealing with categorical data, right? And so let's look at the cylinder variable. First thing we can do, just to summarize it, we can make a table. Oh, and here, as promised, let's talk about, so I have this R code in here. I do not, I repeat, I do not expect you to know this R code or anything. We'll see it in the lab later on. But the reason that I'm introducing it is, well, I was kind of torn actually, because I was going to show you this anyways. So then I figured, well, I may as well show you the code that got me there. And then when you're looking at the lab, then maybe there's like a, some sort of a connection between the lab and what we're doing in class, because that's the number one kind of complaint about this course is the lab had nothing to do with the course. And here I'm saying, well, actually, it does. Has everything to do with the course. Right. That said, this is not something that I would test you on. Right? So the in-class test, so your midterm or your tests and your final, they won't have any R code. Right? I wouldn't ask you something like, how do you make a table of whatever? I'm expecting you to take a table and know what to do with it, but I don't expect you to make a table. We'll leave that for the lab. But at least now you've kind of seen it and it won't be so weird. It's also not that far-fetched. You want to make a table. There's a table function, of course. Okay. So one thing that looks a little bit weird is, okay, so we've got this, uh, MT cars data set that's built into R, that's fine. And we can look at the number of cylinders. 
and we'll talk more about this in the lab, so don't worry about that. But here, right, we've got four cylinders, six cylinders, or eight cylinders. So it doesn't print very nicely, but it prints the categories on top. So we can just write here, we've got our categories. And down here, we've got the counts in each group. So here, we see that, okay, we know from the blurb there's 32 cars in this data set, or you could just add them up. 11 plus 7 plus 14 should equal 32. Right? But 14 of these cars had eight cylinders. Seven of these cars had six cylinders. And 11 of these cars had four cylinders. Here's categorical data. So we summarize categorical data with a table. And this table, to visualize it, we have the choices typically between a pie chart and a, and a bar graph or a bar graph. So what I've done is I've given you both the pie chart and the bar chart for comparison, right? So here we've got four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders, again, four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders. And I want to show you this just to convince you that bar charts are the way to go, right? Because if I asked you to name say this you're giving this to your boss and your boss says but look at this as he's running down the hall well which group is the biggest is it easy to see which group is the biggest if you just have a pie chart not really you could if you had a little bit of time you could probably guess that it's this chart okay. but remember the whole idea of data visualization was be able to look at something quickly and it's just clear and concise what's going on in your data. So whenever you catch yourself and you have to spend a little bit of time looking at this and saying, oh, I think this one's bigger, that's not good, right? That's kind of defeating the purpose of visualizing in the first place, right? Because um, one argument that you could make, if you're arguing for a pie chart, all I want is pie charts. Um, you could say, well, I'll just put labels on there, right? I'll just put how many are in each group. So basically, you're going to write this out. Sorry, 11, 7, 14. Why wouldn't you just give me a table then? Right, it's easy enough. So putting labels on kind of defeats the purpose. Sometimes it's good, you know, for clarity. But when you catch yourself putting labels on because you have to, that's not a good sign. Right? And so here, if you look at the bar chart, it's obvious which one's the tallest. And so we can look at this and say, we don't even have to know about the numbers in each. Right? We can just say, oh, group eight, whatever it is. Right? We might not even know what it is. Group eight had the most in it. Moving on. So we can just gather that information quickly. So that's my two cents about pie charts. The only so that's why we shouldn't use them. The only time that a pie chart is uh, obvious, right, where you can just glance at it and say, oh, well, obviously this one's bigger than this one, or obviously they're roughly the same, is if you have two groups. But if you think about it, if you have two groups, that information could just be communicated with one number. For example, if I tell you that there were 70% males, what percentage females were there? Third. So you could give a huge pie chart to give that information, but you could just give it in one number, right, which is way more efficient. Right. And so, yeah, people like pie charts, but now you can show them up. 
say, no, I don't like pie charts for this reason. That's why, because they're not very good at their job, visualizing data. Huh? Any questions so far? No? Don't use pie charts. And if someone gives you a pie chart, send it back. No, but now you know. A lot of the time, we're not just going to be concerned with one categorical variable. Right? We might be concerned with how are two categorical variables related, just like we were with numerical variables, where we just said, okay, well, we can plot one against the other and make a scatter plot. We looked at that among the first few days that we met. Okay. Um, and we'll come back to that. We'll spend a whole chapter on it, in fact. Okay. But here, we already introduced this VS variable, right? So now let's say we want to look at the number of cylinders and the V-shaped versus straight engine, right? How are these comparing across the two groups? So one thing that we could do is we could just look at the tables individually, where again, we've got just the categories I'll just make a note here. Oops. So here we've got zero is V shaped and one is straight. So in our data set, we had 18 V shaped engines and 14 straight engines. I don't know what to do with that, but that's a fact. Okay. So, of course, we could report that. It seems kind of boring, right? Here's what's in the data. Right? Uh, we might be more interested in knowing, okay, well, what's the relationship between a straight engine and eight cylinders, for example? Right? So to do that, we combine the two variables into one table. And so here we've made a contingency table. So this is a contingency table. So we can split this up like this. Right here we've got our V shaped or straight variable. And then here we've got our cylinder variable. So now this gives us a better idea of how these things behave, right? Because if we're looking at four cylinders, only one of them was V-shaped and the rest were straight. Whereas if we're looking at eight cylinders, then all 14 of them were V-shaped and none of them were straight. Six cylinders, it doesn't seem to matter, right? There's a healthy mix of both. Right? There's three V-shaped and four straight engines. And so for the six cylinder, we've got kind of a 50 50 split. Whereas here for four cylinders, it seems more likely, we're thinking probabilities, right? It seems more likely that we have a straight engine. And if we have eight cylinders, it seems more likely that we would have a V-shaped engine. It's not me talking, that's the data talking. I know nothing about this stuff. So don't worry. Um, so far, we've just looked at these raw counts. Right? And uh, if we're being proper about it, then these raw counts, it's hard for us to look at raw counts and say, oh, out of 32, right? 14 compared to 11 is, I don't know, huge or not that much. So um, what we should be reporting is the proportions. So we'll talk more about proportions today, but a proportion is just the number in the category over the sample size. So here I've got where n is the sample size. 
we saw it before when we were calculating the mean and the standard deviation, right? But just a reminder, a lowercase n is always the sample size. I'll just highlight something here. So when reporting on categorical data, we should use proportions. That's important. I said that, but then later on, I got lazy and I went to raw counts again, but it doesn't matter. Now you know. Do as I say, not as I do. So we should use proportions instead. So what that means is instead of having this table of 1, 10, 3, 4, 14, and 0, right, we would say, well, for this first right, four cylinders, D-shaped engine, we should have one out of 32 there instead. 10 out of 32, three out of 32, right? So we should be looking at these proportions out of the total. And so that's what I've done here, is I've made a table of the proportions, right? So it's the same information, but now we can say, oh, so 3% here, 3% here, shouldn't be the same. Oh, sorry, 31. Skipping zeros. Zeros are important, turns out. Phew, I was worried there was something wrong, but there isn't, just with my reading. That's okay. So here, right, we've made a table of proportions. And again, it doesn't look that good this table that it makes, but the information's all there, V-shaped in the cylinder. If we have a situation like this, so now we've summarized how these two are related. What if we wanna visualize it? We have two options. Okay. And they kind of, they print it on the next page, but um, we've got these two options, and either one is fine. Uh, first one is a segmented bar chart, meaning so each little segment is for each category. Because now we have to look at okay, well, is it V-shaped or straight, and how many cylinders does it have? And so we need some way to uh, group those. So here we have the V-shaped and straight engine. And then each segment shows you the number of cylinders. I actually prefer this one. I'll call it a side-by-side -side bar chart. Just because for me, it's easier to look at this and say, oh, OK, so this one's the smallest. Um, also because it's hard for me to look at this, right, if I wanted to compare the number uh, of six cylinder in engines in each of the categories, right, it's hard for me to look at this and compare it to this. Whereas it's a little bit easier for me to compare these two. But either of these are fine. Uh, I guess the take home message is as long as you're using a bar of some sort, you're safe. But for me, I like to have uh, just these side-by-side -side ones. Right? So then we've got the group of zeros, we've got the group of ones, and then within each group, we've got a bar for each category. Any questions about that? No? So the last thing that we might want to talk about is, I'll just Put a little arrow here. If we have to compare numerical data across some groups, right? So this is where they kind of meet, right? So we've got some numerical data, and so we want to look at, okay, well, what's the fuel economy, right? The miles per gallon for each of these cylinders, right? One way that we could do it, a little bit tedious, but we could. Uh, we could say, okay, well, I'm going to pull out a subset of the four-cylinder engines, 
make a histogram of the miles per gallon, pull out the six cylinder engines, put, make a histogram of those miles per gallons, same thing for the eights, right? Or uh, what we tend to do is make side by side box plots. We looked at how do we make a box plot last day. Um, side by side box plots are just exactly as the name says, side by side box plots. So it breaks up your numerical data by some category. And so here, I'll just make a note here, across groups, groups, remember, means we have a categorical variable. So this is where we combine a numerical variable and a categorical variable. And if we remember from last day, right, so here, because they're on the same scale, we can compare these groups, right? And it's actually pretty easy to see that, well, it looks like there's some sort of downward trend here. If we're talking miles per gallon here, and we've got four cylinder, six cylinder, eight, cylinder, eight cylinders, then uh, it looks like our miles per gallon is on a steady decline as we increase our cylinders. So even though these are categories, we can still look at, okay, how do these groups compare? Remember the, the thick line in the middle is a median. So one thing that you could do is you could just compare the medians of each group. And this is kind of similar to what I get you to do on the assignment as well, right? Which group tends to be heavier? Okay, I should probably do that assignment. Got time. Um, right, but you could, one quick way to do it is you could just compare the medians. Here, because the medians are so far, in fact, the median of this group is lower than the minimum of this other group. Right? So you could draw comparisons like that and say, well, where does the median of this group fall in comparison to the other groups? And same thing here, the median of this group is actually higher than the maximum of this other group, for example. So it just gives us a, a rough idea of what's going on. Any questions? None. Speechless. Okay. So that is chapter one in a nutshell. So you should have everything that you need to do assignment one. Remember, it's due on Wednesday. In class, at the beginning of class, in fact. All right. Let me just grab the chapter two notes from Moodle here. So chapter two notes, there's quite a bit more. Um, this whole course is going to be about probability. Okay? But this is the only section that I'll call probability. So that can be confusing. Um, and what I mean by that is I mean in the classical sense. So uh, combinatorics like uh, counting cards, that kind of thing, rolling a die um flipping a coin so those types of probabilities will only deal with those in chapter two okay? and then we'll go on to continuous probabilities don't need to deal about talk about that now but uh so chapter two is kind of its own beast and um to be quite frank with you i don't like it that much so we're just gonna 
do what we can in here and get in and get out this week. Okay. So that's why I typed them up because there's a lot of definitions. Um, on the downside, these definitions will serve you well in chapter two, but nowhere else. So take it or leave it. Um, but it is part of the curriculum, so we have to cover it. Yeah. So, um, we're not going to go too deep into it, right? We're not going to talk about how do you count cards. I know everyone was so hopeful. It's got to be easy, right? Well, not really. Um, right, but we will talk about some random processes. So a random process is just anything that you can do that'll just yield a random result. So roll a die, right? You're just randomly going to get one, two, three, four, five, or six. Right? Flip a coin, you're either going to get heads or you're going to get tails. Right? You might say, what if it lands on its edge? Then you just wait a little bit and it'll fall. Don't worry. So either way, there's only two outcomes. So we're going to talk about these random processes and the probabilities, bless you, associated with those. Okay. And so there's a lot of terminology. One thing that I wanted to make a note of was that a probability is the same as a proportion, which is essentially the same as a percentage. A percentage is just a hundred times the proportion. And so that's why I say basically the same as a percentage, but all those three P's you can use interchangeably. Right. So a proportion is a probability, which is a percentage. So I might ask you for any one of those three, but really the calculations to get you there are all the same. And so, by definition, the probability of an outcome is the proportion of times that it would happen if you repeated the process an infinite number of times, right? So say you pretend to flip a coin an infinite number of times. You can't do that. Infinity is infinity, uh, right? But we know that because there's only two outcomes, then the probability for each is just one and two. One half, one half. Okay. Same thing for rolling a die. If you have a six sided die, because there are only six outcomes, then each outcome happens with a probability of one over six. Right. So we can use those probabilities. Right. Bless you. Even for the hiccups. So um, here, Right. I've listed all the possible outcomes and the name for that is the sample space. So the sample space is just the list of all possible outcomes that can happen. Okay. And so I'll just highlight that here. So a set of possible outcomes is called the sample space and it's denoted by a capital S. If you have a peek at your formula sheet, you'll see a lot of P's on there. P of A, P of S, P of whatever, P of B. All right. And so we're going to use probability notation just briefly in this section. Um, I'll just introduce that to you. It's not that bad. Uh, just like in the lab, right, where we said, okay, whenever I see some brackets here, just read it as a uh, Right, so you're going to say P of A. Right? P stands for the probability. Right, so when you write P of A, you're really writing the probability of A, but it saves you a lot of writing. And so, oops. P of A is P or the probability. of A and its probability notation. Okay. 
usually we use uh, capital letters. It's not important, but it's just kind of a fun fact. Um, if you know the context of the situation, right? So say you flip a coin, then you could say something like the probability of heads is 0.5 and the probability of tails is 0.5, right? Or even rolling a die. If you know that you're rolling a die, then you could say P of two is one in six. Saves you a lot of writing, right? The probability of rolling a two is one in six. So, um, we'll just become more familiar with that as we go. One thing here is A, in general, denotes a random process or a random outcome. So just any random thing that we could talk about. So A denotes a random process or outcome. So we'll talk more about probability notation, but now let's talk about some probability facts. So there's two main facts of probabilities that we have to always keep in mind. And the first one is that in order to be a probability, it has to be between zero and one. So think about a probability in terms of percentages, right? A probability only has, can only be between zero and 100%, right? But probabilities are uh, between zero and one. The second fact that we have to deal with is that the sum of all the probabilities in your sample space has to total one. So if you've looked at, remember, so this kind of intertwines all our definitions so far. If you look at your sample space, your sample space is a list of all the possible outcomes. And then if you add up all the probabilities of those things, should be one. Because if it's not one yet, you've missed an outcome somewhere. Right? Because the sample space is all possible outcomes. Right? So that's just a rule that we have to uh, check and follow, right? But the sample space, the total sample space, has to be one. These rules are on your formula sheet. Okay? And so, but they're written with probability notation. But easy. And so here, a probability must be between 0 and 1. I've just written as any P of A has to be between 0 and 1. So that's the first thing on your formula sheet. And then the second thing on your formula sheet is that P of S, so the probability of S, where we defined S is the sample space has to equal one. So the total probability of all probabilities in your sample space has to total one. Okay. And we'll use these facts to, uh, to figure out if we have a valid probability distribution in a bit. Okay, so these will come up again, but for now, we'll just leave them there. probably heard the terms mutually exclusive, right? So, oh no, those two things are mutually exclusive, right? Or maybe they are, are not mutually exclusive, right? What we're saying is that we could just say that they're disjoint, but for some reason people like to say mutually exclusive. Okay. Uh, they mean the same thing. It just means if two things are disjoint, then they can never happen at the same time. And so if you're thinking about flipping a coin, for example, you flip a coin just once, right? heads and tails, they're disjoint because they can never happen at the same time. Right? So in one go, you can only get one or the other. Right? You roll a die, one, two, three, four, five, six, they're all disjoint because only one of them can happen at a time. Um, an example of things that are not disjoint, 
would be a deck of cards. Right? So then you've drawn a red card. Right? A red card could also be a diamond, if that's something you're interested in. Right? And so we'll look at that later on. But for now, we'll just talk about some disjoint outcomes. Okay. Let's just do a, I'll just write a little note here that if you flip a coin, if you flip a coin, once, you can only get heads or tails, right, but not both. You can only get heads or tails, but not both, making them disjoint. But not both. So they are disjoint. So, so far we've only talked about flipping a head, flipping a tail, rolling a one, rolling a two. Um, it could be that we're interested in a set of events, right? Or a set of outcomes. So an event is a set of outcomes. So the event that I roll a four or a six, right? Is the set of the two outcomes, four and six. So, and so we'll talk about probabilities of events or probabilities of outcomes and kind of use them interchangeably a little bit, right? But there is a, a slight distinction. So um, as far as an event goes, if I'm interested in more than one outcome, right, rolling a four or a six, for example, then I'm interested in an event. So if I am interested in more than one outcome, I am interested in an event. So, and these events we could also denote by capital letters, right? So let's denote this event, rolling a four or a six, I don't care which one, right? As long as it's one of those two, let's say I bet some money on it, I wouldn't bet money on stuff. Let's say I did though. And I placed bets on four or six, and I don't care which one happens, as long as one of those happens, and I wanna know the probability of this event happening. So I can denote this event by a B. We've already used A, use B, doesn't matter. Okay. And here, kind of nasty set notation. Uh, it's not something that we'll talk about, but it is proper, so I threw it in there. Right? But we can just denote B is the set of four and six. So, how do we calculate this probability? This is a special case because four and six are disjoint. We'll talk about just here, uh, what happens when they're not disjoint, right? But just to introduce the idea, what we would do is, well, the probability of B is just the probability of four plus the probability of six because they're disjoint. So the probability of four or six is one in six plus one in six, so you can just add them up. But this is a special case for disjoint outcomes. So I'll make a note here. We can only do this if the outcomes are disjoint. If the outcomes are disjoint.
So now let's have a look at what happens if these two things that we're interested in are not disjoint. A deck of cards is a really good example of just different things. There's lots of things that we could talk about, right? We might be interested in the suit, the face cards, uh, the individual numbers. There's lots of things, uh, blacks, reds. Right? There's lots of ways that we can slice or dice a deck or cut a deck. So that's why a deck of cards is just nice to deal with. Oh, that was a nasty, right? On the printout, it's not too obvious. So I'll just make a note here that these guys, they're the black cards and the bottom two layers are the red cards. Just because it's not, it's not clear when I print it black and white. So let's say, I'm interested in drawing a face card and drawing a diamond. Right. So I'm interested in all these diamonds, any of them, and any of these face cards. Right. Notice that we have this overlap here of the diamond face cards, right. making them not disjoint. What are some disjoint outcomes in here? Well, there's lots, but um, some disjoint outcomes would be black cards and red cards. Right? A card can't be black and red at the same time. You only draw one card. Um, you could break it up, right? Face cards versus non-face cards. Card is either one or the other, right? It's either diamond or not a diamond, that kind of thing. So those situations are all disjoint. Here, the situation that we're talking about, they're not disjoint, right? Because we have this overlap here. So I'll just circle that on here and say that we have this overlap. So, and I'm just gonna use F and D, capital F and capital D, just because I've defined them down here. So if you're going to do something like that where you're just going to use shorthand, then you should probably define them, right? And then you can just use F and D in your, in your writing if you want to. It saves you a lot of time. Uh, I'm just teaching you shortcuts here. Probability notation, outcome notation. So F and D. are not disjoint. These two events are not disjoint. This circled area, right, the overlap, how would we classify that in terms of F and D? So here, these cards, these three cards, are both F and D. And so here, this would be F and D. We can talk about just the face cards. We can talk about just the diamonds. But now we can also talk about the face and the diamond cards. Right? So that little bit of overlap is now its own thing. Right, F and D. Regardless of the overlap, we can still talk about the probabilities of each. So a standard deck of cards has 52 cards in it, right? And so if you want to, just like rolling a die and looking at the possible outcomes, we could figure out, okay, if there are six outcomes, then each one happens with the same probability, so one in six. And same thing goes here. Each of these cards has a one in 52 chance of happening, right? And so what we could do is the probability of a face card, we just count how many of these are face cards, 12. 12 out of 52 is the probability of drawing one of these. Right? Same thing for the diamonds. There are 
there is 13 in each suit. And so the probability of drawing a diamond is 13 out of 52. So we can find those probabilities, right? Um, that's fine. It doesn't care about the overlap. Where we start caring about the overlap is if I ask you, well, what's the probability of a face card or a diamond? So now, right, I don't care if it's a face card or if it's a diamond, as long as it's one of those, then that's the outcome that I'm interested in. And so what we could do is we could count these and say, well, I know there's 13 here, and then 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 22 out of 52 cards satisfy that criteria of being either a diamond or a face card. So here, I have that here. By simply counting the number of cards that satisfy the F or D criteria, we find the probability of F or D is 22 over 52. Right. So just by counting, we can figure out the probability. But if we just do 12 over 52 plus 13 over 52, we wouldn't get 22 over 52, right? We'd get 25 over 52. And the reason for that is because over 52, right? That's these guys here. So you've got kind of, um, I imagine like a, a layer, okay? and the overlap just kind of has well, two layers on it. Right? And so we've got the 13 over 52. If we added that to the 12 over 52, we've got this section where we've counted it twice. Right? So in general, what we do is we just subtract overlap, right? Just to smooth it out, right? Because if you imagine it as a, as kind of a plane here, right? We've got smooth surface, and then we've got a, a bump here because we've counted these three twice, and then here's smooth surface. We've only calculated these or counted these once, and so we just remove this one section, one of the overlaps. So that's where this came from. So the probability of F or D is the probability of F plus the probability of D, but then subtract the overlap. And that's how we get to the 22 over 52. So in general, on your formula sheet, you have this formula. So the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B, right? just like you would before, uh, but then you have to subtract the overlap. So that idea remains the same always. Why was it a special case when we had those disjoint outcomes where we were able to ignore this section? I guess it's still going to print on my hand, but you know what I mean. Uh, right? Before, when we talked about rolling a four or a six, we said that we could do the probability of four plus the probability of a six because they were disjoint, right? We made a note and said, this only works if they're disjoint. If two outcomes are disjoint, let's think back to the definition, they can never happen together, right? If two things are disjoint, then probability of A and B is zero. So that's another way that you could check to see if things are disjoint. Right? If there's a probability of them happening together, then no, they're not disjoint. Okay. And so if they're disjoint, then this section just becomes zero. Right? And then we're left with that special case that we started with, just because that's a nice kind of introduction to it. Right. But in general, we should be using this formula. And on your formula sheet, we skip the complement, but, but we'll get there. Um, and that formula is on your formula sheet. The okay. probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap 
probability of A and B. As far as questions that you'll have to be able to handle, right, I'll give you three pieces of information and ask you to solve for the fourth one. Right here, we have four pieces of information, one, two, three, four. And so I can give you any three of these. Right? It doesn't have to be these three. I can give you these three, solve for P of A, for example. Right? So you need to know your way around that formula. Any questions so far? Lots of definitions. We probably won't get to our example until next day, but you can try. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about A and B can be either outcomes or events. But yeah, we will only deal with two things in this course. Any other questions? Keep going. Got it. All right. So, um, let's just make a note here, right? What we're doing here is that we subtract the overlap. So let's talk about probability distributions. So like I said, we're gonna, we come back to those probability rules when we're talking about probability distribution. So a probability distribution is a table of all the possible outcomes, all the possible disjoint outcomes. And we'll talk about that in a second. And their probability is listed beneath there. Beneath that. Uh, in this case, We've rolled, we've got crazy here. We rolled two dice and we looked at the sum of the two dice. And so the small or the smallest roll that you can have is a one and a one. So the sum is two. The highest roll that you could have is a six and a six. The highest sum is 12. And so now we're looking at the probability distribution of the sum of two dice. Notice how the probabilities are different now. It gets a little boring when we're only talking about rolling one die, then it's one and six, one and six, one and six, one and six. So this one's fun because we get to change the probabilities a little bit. There's 36 different outcomes. You don't need to know how to find that. I would give it to you. Uh, but the 36 different outcomes, there's only one way to get a sum of two, it's a one and a one. But there's two ways to get a sum of three, one and a two, and a two and a one. Sounds similar, right? But they're different, they're different events. Same thing for a sum of four, there's three different ways of getting a sum of four, right? And so that's why these probabilities, they, Increase, increase until you hit a maximum of seven. Right? There's six ways to get a sum of seven. And then it decreases again. And so uh, if you're betting, right, these values probably don't have that big of a payout if you're betting on these numbers, right? Because they're more common, the probability of them happening is much higher. Whereas if you're betting on some of these extreme numbers, right? probably a higher payout, but also lower probability of them happening. Right? Those always go hand in hand, unfortunately. Okay. So this is a probability distribution. So one of the questions I'll ask on a test is something like this. Right? I'll give you three possible probability distributions and you have to pick the one that's valid. And so in order to be a valid probability distribution, it has to satisfy three things. First, 
or actually the second two we've seen already. Right? The first one that we introduced is just, okay, well, each of the things that we're looking at has to be disjoint, right? There can't be any overlap in these things, otherwise we can't talk about the probabilities of them individually, right? Seems reasonable enough. So that's the first thing that you're gonna check. Are each of these outcomes disjoint, no overlap? Next thing you're gonna check, so if that checks out, moving on to the next thing, right? We're trying to eliminate uh, distributions here. So I guess we can look at, so here's the example that I've got. Um, these outcomes are disjoint, right? In thousands of dollars, the income range between zero and 24, there's no overlap with 25 to 49, no overlap with 50 to 99, and no overlap to 100 plus. So that's all good. So this one checks out for all three of them. As any probability, if you find one that has a probability that's not between zero and one, it's out. Right? Because that's not a valid probability in general. So just kind of glancing here, they all are zeros except for this negative here, right? And so distribution B, it's out. It can't be one of the options because we have a negative probability. So I'll just make a note here. So can't have a negative probability. Squeeze it in there. But all the other ones look good. They're all between zero and one. And then uh, the next one we have to check is the sum of the probabilities across the board has to be one. And so here, this one has a total of 1.06, and this one has a total of one. So C satisfies all the criteria. It is the valid probability distribution. I know I'm out of time. I'll just mention the complement. We've already talked about it. The complement of an event, hard to say, uh, is just the opposite of it. Mm -hmm. right. So the complement of being male is the female, etc. We'll talk more about it next day. But, so uh, let me know if you need me to make photocopies. Yeah. Maybe just hang back here and I'll stop this recording.